Facebook team. This is uh, Tim White, Command Chief, Air Force Reserve Command, and I'm here with my wingman and my boss, the one and only Lieutenant General Richard Scobie, the commander of Air Force Reserve Command and Chief of Air Force Reserve. We got a special guest uh, for you today, Mr. Lee Floyd, our Chief uh, Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion Officer. We're gonna talk about uh, a few things. This is gonna be a free-flowing discussion. So before we kind of get into it, uh, I, I wanna turn it over to, to Lee, just to kind of, if you can, and just introduce yourself, Lee, and, and tell us what you do uh, for the command. Thank you much, Chief. And boss, also thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I am the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the command. And in this capacity, it is incumbent upon me to ensure that we ingrain diversity and inclusion to the fiber of everything that we do. Uh, considering what we've had taking place in the country uh, in recent months, uh, it has become extremely important that we not only have these types of discussions, but that we take a good hard look at everything that we're doing, the processes, the procedures uh, that are part of the command and ensure that we're not doing anything from uh, preventing our members from rising to the highest level of responsibility possible. So we've been busy. Uh, but uh, that's part of the job. But we're, 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 we're certain we're going to get to where we need to go at the end of the day. Hey, so Lee, if you don't mind, man, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this thing off. And, and I'll tell you that so the beauty of, of the boss and I being, being in this assignment is that we have a team. And the team always looks out for our best interests and they, they want to protect us. So they kind of sent us some, uh, some things they wanted to ask you that were within the hash mark. But at the same time, hey, the airmen want to hear it from us, and they want and they want to hear it straight from us, and they want to hear it straight. So, hey, I appreciate some of those uh, preloaded questions, but we are going to get right down to, to, to business and, and talk about and address what needs to be talked about and what needs to be addressed. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start off, Lee, because you mentioned just the um, the, the the issue that we're that we're dealing with right now, especially when it comes to uh, Racial uh, tensions, inequalities, and justice, those things across the country right now. So what I what I found um, is that uh, senior leaders either either are maybe un, uh, unequipped or even sometimes unwilling. I think just to take tackle these issues and talk about this head on. What advice do you have for senior leaders that may be watching? Um, what are some of the risks if, if we don't get out in front of this thing as senior leaders? You know, thank you for that question, Chief. Uh, it's, and I've had to answer this question quite a bit lately. So leaders, the first thing that I would say to you all is this. Lead. You were placed in the positions that you currently hold for the skill set that you bring to the war fight. So lead. Lead from the, from the front. Secondly, I would say this. We cannot afford for you, our leaders, to show, your, to show your fear in the area of race relations. We need for you to embrace the differences, to encourage our members, to let them know that it's okay for us to be different. And number two, it's okay for us to start this dialogue that we've been not having in our past. Part of the problem that we have right now is that we have, uh, have not allowed ourselves to be uncomfortable. We run from the discomfort. We seek the easy route as opposed to coming face to face with the issues uh, that are that are creating the, the problems that we currently have right now. All right. Hey, and uh, one of the other things here that uh, about being a chief and about being a leader is that all leaders make mistakes. And I just made a huge one by not introducing my boss and giving him the time opportunity to, 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 <laughs> to speak the leader of the Air Force Reserve Command, the Chief of Air Force Reserve, our fearless leader, General Scobie, over to you, sir, for some comments. <laughs> hey, Mr. Floyd uh, and Chief, my, my wingman, uh, you, are all, uh, you are never uh, incorrect in the way you conduct business, that's for sure. But I will say, uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks for a couple things. One, thanks, Chief, for taking on this responsibility. You know, as all of our airmen know, you and I, are a leadership team and we work together along with our spouses to ensure that we take care of our 74,000 people. And part of that is talking about diversity and inclusion. And I'll say, you know, as, as we went through these things, we couldn't have a better teammate than we have in Mr. Floyd. 
Uh, I've known him for many years and have learned to trust his judgment and, uh, and his expertise, especially in these uh, and really tough issues that we've been going through. And I don't know, you know, when we look back at what happened over the last few months in our country, especially when it comes to uh, really getting after the issues of, of racial inequality, uh, not only across our country, but in our force as well, that, we're, that we've been looking at. One of the things that I, I, I always thought we were leading the Air Force and how we do diversity and inclusion, but I, don't, I wouldn't say I was blind, but I certainly, uh, looking back, I didn't have 20-20 vision on the things that were going on. And a lot of this has really brought to the surface uh, some of the things that I know that we can do better at. And uh, with Mr. Floyd's leadership, I know that we are. But I can tell you, this uh, is not going to just pass us by. We are not going to just wait uh, for this uh, crisis uh, to be over, and then we're going to go back to business as usual. What's going to happen is we're going to take this opportunity, just like Mr. Floyd started out talking about. We're going to take this opportunity, and we're going to uh, continue to make a difference. And I'll tell you how we're going to do that. We're going to do that with uh, ownership. We're going to own this problem. There are things within our command and within the Air Force that have to be changed because um, they weren't set up to create inequality, but they certainly do create some inequality. And we're going to look at everything from how we promote to how we punish, how we further people's career. We're going to make sure that we're looking at those things going forward, and we're going to own the problem that we have. The other thing is uh, the words that we use. We're going to continue to discuss uh, diversity and inclusion as we go forward. And I'm going to ask Mr. Floyd to talk a little bit about that right here in a second. And the last thing is our actions. Our airmen are going to judge us. <laughs> they do every day by what we do to make sure that we take care of them and their families. And this is going to be part of this. Um, you know, uh, the command chief and I, every day we show up to work, we have a smile on our face uh, because we work in an incredible organization uh, where we feel valued. And uh, I guess it would be a pretty lousy organization if the two people running it didn't feel that way. But we feel valued. Um, every one of our airmen deserves that same feeling when they walk through the door. And it's regardless of their gender, ethnicity, racial, or race, race or um, their, uh, their sexual orientation. All these things have no uh, bearing on how much somebody contributes to our organization. So we're going to continue to do those things. So while I have the mic, Chief, because I know you're wanting to take it away from me. What I'd like to do is, uh, and Mr. Floyd, uh, as we go forward, could you kind of talk to us about, one is, how are we, how are we set up in the Reserve Command uh, to talk about diversity and inclusion within our organizations, our 45 wing and wing, wing equivalents, and how do you see it going uh, forward in the future based on the conversations the three of us have had? Thank you so much, boss, for that. And, and again, I want to thank you and the chief for everything that you all do on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that we have fairness and equality throughout the command. So in response to your, your question, some of the things that we've done, and I, and I want to go, I want to, I want to step back a little bit. I want to talk about some of the things that we've done since the early 90s, if you don't mind. And as you recall, we started way back in the day with one of the uh, Woolworth County sit-in members, uh, Major General uh, McNeil, Joseph McNeil. Uh, he was our chair of our diversity uh, uh, of the Human Resource Development Council. And what we did with the HRDC was we ingrained or we infused a lot of the elements of diversity and inclusion, retention, promotions, utilization of skill, uh, discharge, involuntary, um, equal opportunity and treatment, all of those things, promotions and education, all the things that you are currently talking about, we here in this command, we have been taking a look at those things for a long, long time. So how are we better suited then to deal with this than a lot of the other federal agencies? Number one is that we have not waited for the world to tell us that we need to be concerned about diversity and inclusion. We have been ensuring that each and every member of our organization know that they are a valued member of the organization. Now, whether or not they believe that is a totally different story, but that's what is going on now. We're trying to reemphasize the fact that number one, if we bring you on the team, you are going to be utilized to your fullest potential. No one's gonna place any artificial barriers that might prevent you from rising to the highest level of responsibility possible. So in doing that, 
What we've done is we've created a way of life, not another program, but a way of existing within this command, within this framework, whereby every member has the freedom to contribute. Every member knows that they are empowered if there is something that is preventing them, that there is to be someone within their chain of command to address that wrongdoing. So boss, I wanna to say to you and to all of those folks that are currently listening, that we have not sat idly by, that we have been proactive in this approach, and we're going to continue to do that. Now, what are we currently doing? Number one, we are training uh, unconscious bias, cross-cultural awareness to all of our wings. As you know, we've established that our vice commanders are our uh, diversity and inclusion program managers, and they in themselves have selected members from within their respective wings to actually execute the program or the initiatives that we come up with in the area of diversity and inclusion. But we've taken it a step further. Myself, as well as my deputy, we're going to undergo some facilitation, uh, unconscious bias facilitation training next week. And that's going to enable us to actually bring members in from each and every one of our wings, train them in the skill of facilitating unconscious bias and, and those things. And now we're going to have a critical mass that we can start deploying a lot of these skills and tactics out there in the wings themselves. So those are some of the things that we currently have going on, boss. Hey, Lee, hey, man. That's great. Go ahead, Tim. No, go ahead, sir. All I was going to say is, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the things that you've brought to the fight uh, for us uh, up to this point. Uh, what do you see going forward in the future? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that your whoever takes your seat when you're gone and whoever replaces the chief, that they have the same passion for equality and fairness that you all bring to the fight. Uh, I, it is my vision to grow our diversity branch, uh, bring on some more members so that we can do constant data analysis, outreach and marketing, education and training, so that we don't fall back into the trap that some of us have fallen into thus far. So we, now that the iron is hot, we want to continue to strike and we want to make sure that DNI is not another program that falls off the table, but becomes a way of life for us here in this command. Well, so, uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, you, you hit on something that's close to my heart, and it's uh, two pieces to it. One is we put resources on the things that are a priority for our command. So you can bet that we are going to uh, figure out the best way to resource some of this, uh, uh, especially the DNI things that you're trying to get after. And I know that program is going to work well for us. And so the chief and I are going to put resources after some of those programs. And the other thing is making sure that, uh, that we're involved. I guarantee you that whoever replaces me and whoever replaces, well, whoever comes after the chief, nobody can replace our chief. But whoever <laughs> comes after our chief, um, those folks uh, will have this uh, in their DNA. And I'll tell you why. It's because of the things that we've tried to do in our, in our command is build three types of culture. It's a culture of compliance, compliance and doing the things we need to do as a command to produce combat power. It's a culture of being in the reserves and uh, what that means, because we are all in the reserves for a specific reason. And it's a culture of diversity and inclusion. That's a culture that has to uh, be underpin everything else that we do, because when we start to have an organization where all those barriers start to melt away and we can just get after the work that we need to do and everybody feels like they're valued just like you said before that is what's going to be that's what success looks like and that's how we're going to measure it thanks mr floyd i'll turn it over to uh the command chief for the next question all right hey uh, thanks boss hey mr floyd you mentioned unconscious bias and i can tell you uh, as leaders we, we like to think that uh we can see within those blind spots but i tell you what i had an, an, an uh, episode of that just today I had to go to an auto park, uh, auto park store to, to get something for my vehicle. Walked in, there's a female and there's a male, both at the counter, and guess what? I bypassed the female. I immediately went to the male because he is going to help me with, with my problem. We're talking about um, an auto park store. And with, with, what, without a doubt, after he couldn't help me, he turned to her who really knew what was going on. And then she was the one that ended up ultimately fixing my problem. She happened to be the manager and the subject matter expert uh, for, for, uh, for basically for the store. So what do you say? And so I, I, I seen it myself and, and I kind of gave her that look and she looked and it was kind of one of those things that, Hey, guess what? It just happens all the time. And that, and that's really unfortunate. So what do you say 
to, to leaders who say that uh, all I see is OCPs, all I see is red, white, and blue. I don't see any color. I have no unconscious bias. What kind of pitfalls are they uh, subjecting themselves to? Well, they're opening themselves up for number one to be challenged, uh, and number two for ridicule. Number one is this, Chief. Let me let me talk a little bit about the unconscious bias piece first, if you don't mind. I think what is happening to a lot of us is that we are we look at the title or the term unconscious bias and we see it as a negative. What we need to start understanding is that if you are a human being, if you breathe air, if you have a brain, you have unconscious bias. No human is excluded or exempt from unconscious bias. But unconscious bias in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It is just a human thing. It happens to all of us. It's, it's based on preferences. And there's a fist-sized part of your brain that deals with the senses and deals with this unconscious bias thing. So you doing things every day that you don't realize you do. The key to overcoming unconscious bias is number one, acknowledging the fact that you have unconscious bias. And number two, working towards mitigating those things that create an opportunity for you to rely on unconscious bias. We know that stress, we know that high ops tempo and all those things, it, it places us in a position to, to go to the easy, the quick, the fast, the right now. So unconscious bias feeds on those types of things. We have to know and, and, and get to a point of recognition and realizing when those unconscious biases are starting to kick in. So that's the unconscious bias piece. So number two is simply this. For those who would tend to believe that they do not have unconscious bias, and I have spoken to a lot of leaders in recent months who say, I'm not biased, I'm, I'm, I'm fair, and I treat everybody great, and when I look out across the world, I don't see color, I see OTP. Here's what I say to them. Number one, stop lying to your troops because there is no way in the world for you to look at me and not see that I'm a black man. So you just lied to me if you told me you don't see color. It's okay for you to see color. It's okay for you to see differences. It is those differences that gives us the strength and the power that we have. So that's what I would say to our leaders. Let's start embracing the differences. Let's start embracing those things that are unique to the individual and utilizing them to help us put bomb on target, to accomplish our mission. It's as simple as that, Chief. Boss, over to you for any uh, comments or, or the next question. And thanks, Lee, for that, for that answer. You're welcome. Hey, Mr. Floyd, I tell you, the, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. And uh, I'll tell you what the chief and I are looking for in an organization. Um, we're looking for people that are different. You know, the reason why the command chief and I take every decision brief together you know, and that is hard to get our schedules together sometimes because the chief's got, he's got, you know, he's got his personal schedule of, of uh, events to go to, balls and uh, extravagant events. And I have, uh, I have meetings to go to in the engine room. But um, so to get our schedules together is really tough. But whenever we do a decision brief, we take it together. And the reason why is, is because I don't have all the answers myself. And uh, if I have a, a discussion with the command chief about what's going on, he represents 75% of who we are in our great enlisted force. And so I grew up in the officer stovepipe, um, and, and, uh, and that is the lens through which I look at things. The command chief grew up as an, an incredible young uh, senior now, non-commissioned officer, and that's the lens that he sees things through. So when we make decisions that are going to affect our force, it makes sense that we would make those decisions together in order to, to – maximize the benefit to our people not only that but i grew up in a, in a different uh in a different environment a different family environment than the, than the command chief did and uh, different parts of the country and all those differences uh really help us with what we're trying to accomplish uh, because we see things a little bit different so embracing the differences that you just talked about that's exactly right when i go into a meeting I ask different people about their opinion on things, not because I don't think I'm capable of making a good decision, but I just want to make sure that I have, if I have time, I, wanted to, I want to make sure that we have all the information necessary to make the best decision for our command. Uh, if I have to make a split decision, split second decision, you know, I'm a fighter pilot and uh, I also see the world through that lens and I am very capable of making those decisions. So, uh, but given the uh, amount of time and the resources that we have in our command, I would much rather make a decision uh, that is thoughtful and, uh, and considerate of everybody we have. And I can do that only when I have people like our command chief, who we are 
very fortunate to have in our command because he takes that same approach. And if he needs more information, he'll ask for more information as we go forward. And that has made all these decisions better. And I'll start off with the first one we made together, uh, you know, getting rid of no pay, no points. There may be some, there are some reasons why no pay, no points was, uh, was, was made and we kept it. Uh, but there are more reasons why we got rid of it. And it's because of uh, it's because of great leadership and people standing up and and taking a stand on what affects our uh, our airmen that makes the difference. So um, seeing people as different and what they bring to the table and including them in the decisions that has made all the difference for me in my career. That's for sure. Um, so I get uh, the uh, the chief uh, deferred to me for the for for the next question. This is what I wanted to ask, Mr. Floyd. So uh, you hear a lot of the senior leaders saying, uh, hey, we have to be able to be prepared and be able to have tough conversations, uh, uncomfortable conversations. And uh, to me, as we start down this path, uh, I'm not having uncomfortable conversations. You know, there are definitely conversations that I would have never had uh, if it wasn't for the things uh, that happened in our, uh, in our country, that's for sure. Uh, but when when uh, it seems to me that it's kind of a buzzword, but I want to get your take on it. What is uh, what does it mean when somebody says, "Hey, we need to be prepared to have uncomfortable conversations"? There's there's actually two parts to that, boss. So number one, I think one must first ask themselves, "What about the conversation makes me uncomfortable?" And I will tell you that it is more about the individual having a discussion than it is the topic of discussion. So that is that is first and foremost. But secondly, I would say this again, I wanna reiterate something that I said up front. You have placed a lot of your leaders in the positions that they're in because of the trust that you, you have in them. And they've gone through training and schools and all these things. So I would say to you that a lot of these discussions that people are calling uncomfortable discussions really shouldn't be uncomfortable. They should just be a discussion uh, of differences. It should be a discussion, a discussion based on the fact that I'm coming, from, I'm coming from a position where I don't know much about the topic. I'm relying on you to give me some additional inf information that will help me grow in that particular area. So what we can't do is keep approaching each other with a barrier between us, a barrier of defensiveness, a barrier of ignorance. The more we know about this stuff, the more time we spend with each other, the better we're going to be uh, suited to deal with these conversations, if you will. And we'll stop calling them difficult conversations, but we'll call them much needed conversations. I like a needed conversation a whole lot better. That's great. Thanks, Mr. Floyd. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Hey, hey, Mr. Floyd. Hey, I wanna I wanna piggyback on something the boss just said when he talked about uncomfortable uh, conversations. And we've had plenty of conversations, and I can tell you, if you want to see a room get uncomfortable, body language get uncomfortable, you throw out the term or the phrase white privilege. Now, I don't know exactly uh, what white privilege is. I do, uh, we were having this conversation, I was having this conversation with one of my peers, and I can certainly understand how someone can be offended by saying that, uh, Hey, guess what? I was I was uh, given a leg up because of the color of my skin, or I didn't have to work, or or um, I had to work just as hard as you did to get where you are. So how is that a privilege? Just as I would could be offended if someone was to say that, hey, guess what? I was hired uh, under affirmative action and I wasn't qualified for the role, but because of the color of my skin. So we were having this conversations, and, and although. I can't uh, give you a definition of what that term white privilege is. What I did say to my peer was, I do know this, that uh, no one will ever question you or no one will ever say to you that you were hired just because you're black. And I know that there are some folks that, uh, that, that possibly think that and even can say that in certain circles when it comes to either people my, like myself maybe someone like the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force who happened to be black in, 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 uh, in these type of positions. So what, is that, what does that term exactly mean and why does that make people so uncomfortable? Chief, thank you, that is a really good question. And a lot of, you know, and going across the country and a lot of these crucial conversations that I've been having with the wings and, and I think we even had this discussion out at ARPC 
uh, last week when I was out there visiting the leadership out there. And this topic of discussion actually came up. So white privilege is actually a societal privilege that benefits whites over non-whites. Uh, uh, in some societies, particularly in the area of, you know, social, political, economic circumstances. But here's the problem with white privilege or the term white privilege. A lot of people tend to want to associate the term white privilege with racism or racist. Uh, when in essence, nothing could be farther from the truth. Having white privilege and recognizing it is not racist. But white privilege exists because of historic, uh, enduring racist and biased practices in this country. Therefore, defining white privilege also requires that everyone needs to fully understand the definitions of racism as well as bias. Thus, our continued education training in the area of unconscious bias, cross-cultural awareness, and those types of things. But I would also want to add this, Chief, is that we really need to stop getting defensive. And I think that is one of the biggest barriers that we're seeing in having these discussions. I would say to our white airmen, uh, I would say this, when you hear the term white privilege, stop, take a breath, and ask yourself this question. What exactly are they saying? What is it, what does it really mean? We know this, that ignorance has become a, a, a really big part of the issues and problems and concerns that we're facing in this area of race relations. We realize that we don't know as much as we should know about the people that we sit and work beside every day, Chief. So I'm gonna say to a lot of our white leaders, a lot of my, my, my uh, uh, fellow airmen, that terminology in and of itself is not a bad thing. Understanding or lack thereof is what the real issue is. So don't be afraid to engage someone if they want to talk about white privilege. You need to understand or even ask this question. Well, when you say white privilege, exactly what is it that you're talking about? So that there's clarification. So there's no misunderstanding. If a person is calling someone a racist, let's make sure, hey, yeah, I'm calling you a racist. But if they're just merely saying that, guess what? When you wake up every day, you don't have to think about going to the store and being followed or being pulled over and shot or telling your kids or giving them the, the, the story or, or having the talk with them. When you get up every day, you talk about going or think about going to work and enjoying your day, taking care of your family, just enjoying life. Well, some of us don't have the, the, the privilege of that. Some of us don't have the, the benefit of being able to, 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 to think about that and that alone. All those other things are part of our lives as well. So I think that the more understanding we have of each other, the more appreciation we have of each other, the more we take time to get to know each other and the differences that we bring to the war fight, the better we're gonna be able to deal with these terminologies such as white privilege. I remember when I first uh, took the COC course from you, and I don't know if you remember or not, mm -hmm. but um, there's, there's basically about four areas that we don't talk about in this, uh, in this command. It's been pretty much as taboo. And that's uh, sexual orientation, race, religion, and politics. Now, as far as uh, as uh, you know, religion, I think we've come a long way with that. And certain laws have, have changed as far as sexual orientation come a long way. But still, this 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 race and and, and politics thing is still when we talk about being in a, in a workplace, it, it can be still taboo. Yeah. Have we? Um, and because you talked about the things that we were doing since the 90s. Um, have we been doing it, have we been getting that wrong, in your opinion, by not having these conversations a long time ago and that's just so so uh, part in, ingrained in our culture? Have we been getting that wrong? Yeah, I, I, I believe we have, Chief, and that's an awesome question. What I see in that area is this. For Forever, we've refused to talk about those things that are really, really, really important to us. Religion, politics, uh, sexual orientation, uh, all those types of things. And, and, and I think the standing rule has been you don't talk politics and religion in the workplace. Well, look where we're at right now. Look what it's got us. All right. And we found out that in the EO arena, 95% of all of their EO cases is between friends, people who know themselves. Well, here's why that is the case. The reason for that is because I sit beside you all day, every day. And I don't know what your values, your beliefs, your, your, you know, what's important to you because I don't talk to you. And here I am sitting there making these racial or sexual jokes or comments, well, and, and, and I'm offending you all the time. So now guess what? I've had enough. I go in, file a complaint against you, 
Well, I didn't know I was offended. Well, why didn't you know it? Because we didn't talk to each other. I would say this, we need to get to a point where that becomes okay. But I would say, I would also say, Chief, that you just can't walk in the office on you know, any given day and start talking about that stuff. We have to do the legwork. We got to build a foundation, trust in each other, so that when we have these discussions, it is about the topic and not about us as individuals. And that is the problem with having that discussion. It's not the topic of discussion that is the issue. It is the individuals that are having the discussion. We've just not learned how to trust each other. We've not learned how to value each other's opinion. Here's how that should look, Chief. You tell me your opinion, what's important to you. I share mine with you. At the end of the day, we go out there, turn that wrench, we get that aircraft in the air. It's as simple as that. But we've not gotten to that point, and that's where we need to be. So I've been telling the, I've been telling the world, it's okay. Go out there, talk about politics, talk about religion, talk about those things that's important to you. We got to get away from those old, archaic thought processes and thinking from yesteryear. We got to move the ball to right now. Great question, Chief. Uh, boss, over to you for uh, hey, hey Lee, man. I appreciate uh, repeat, appreciate that uh, that response. Boss, uh, anything to add on that uh, that particular question or topic? You know, I got uh, there's uh, there's three things that are that I really want to say, um, and, and not about that last topic because I think Mr. Floyd uh, covered it really well. Um, here are my three things. One is uh, Mr. Floyd is an incredible airman, um, and I want to thank him for his service to this country, which has been extensive, but also to this command. And especially in what we're doing with DNI, if I look across all the MAGCOMs, there are 10 MAGCOMs in our Air Force. Uh, nobody is as far along as we are with setting up a structure to make sure that we are addressing the issues and putting the resources uh, to bear against the problem that we see in our command, in our Air Force and the Department of Defense across our nation. Um, my goal is for us in the Reserve Command to be the example for our Air Force. Actually, we are already that. Uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, programs are being benchmarked across uh, a lot of the MAGCOMs right now and, and probably all of them eventually. But what I wanna be is, I wanna be the organization that everybody points to and goes, hey, the Air Force Reserve Command, they got it right. Um, what can we do to be more like them? And then what I want our airmen to be able to do is say, that is a place I want to serve because I know I'll be valued for the things I, I bring. So my first thing I wanted to say is thanks to Mr. Floyd. The second thing is thanks to my, uh, my wingman, the command chief. Tim White is uh, one of the finest uh, humans I've had the chance to serve with in, in my career. It's been, uh, it's been a great honor to be able to uh, meet the challenges uh, that we face every day in our command with somebody of, of his character. And that has been uh, that has been fantastic. I hate to say nice things about him when he's listening, but um, but I, but I promise you all that is uh, that is absolutely true. And the last thing I want to say is uh, to our airmen, um, you deserve to show up to work every day in organizations that values you for what you bring to the table, that sees how you're different, but embraces those differences because the perspective that you bring is going to make us better. When we are able to do that, and we have a culture of including everybody, regardless of how they grew up, what the color of their skin is, their gender, uh, sexual orientation, you name it, whatever their differences are, when we can see past their differences and embrace those so that we make better decisions uh, for our airmen and better decisions for the combat power that we produce for America, this is gonna be an incredible organization to be a part of. It already is, but we need to do more. We need to make it better. And we can only do that with your help. So if you're out there and you see problems in your organization, talk about those problems. If you're not being heard, make sure you raise it to the next level. The reason why we, we, uh, we put commanders in organizations is to solve problems. The reason why we, we hire senior enlisted advisors or command chiefs is to help to solve problems. The reason why we put first sergeants and chaplains and key spouses in organization, help you to solve problems, give you a place, people to talk to, to voice your opinion or problems that you see. The reason why the command chief and I exist 
is to run those problems to ground, make sure we put resources against them, and create an organization that is second to none. But we can only do that if everybody is with us. It takes 74,000 of us to make this command work. I can't do it with one less. I certainly can't do it if we start marginalizing any segment of our population. Thanks for helping me with this uh, issue. Thanks for being on the team with the command chief and me. Uh, we couldn't do it without you and your value. Thanks. Over to you. I'll give the command chief the last word, as always. <laughs> hey, boss. So uh, anything in, uh, and of course, uh, one thing that I love about uh, General Scobie and this team is the failures uh, we, we own. And um, all the successes, I mean, that man will give credit to, to someone else before he takes credit uh, for himself. But, uh, boss, you're the reason why, why we're going to get past uh, uh, the hurdles that we have in our command and we're going to be better uh, because at, at the end of it, uh, when we come out of this thing. So I want to say thank you to boss, uh, to your leadership, and uh, Mr. Floyd. I want to say thank you for uh, being, again, like what the boss said, for being the, the, the example, the, the stellar airman that you are, and, and really guiding us through this and mentoring us through this. So, hey, that's all I have to say, but any last words uh, from you, Mr. Floyd, as we, uh, as we get after um, taking care of him? And any, any last words over to you before we close this thing out? I would just like to thank both you and the boss for uh, having this discussion with me affording me an opportunity to share some knowledge, some vision, uh, and to continue to move the ball down the field. I just want to remind all of our airmen to do this. Continue to treat the individual with infinite dignity and worth. And if when, we, when we do that, we know that we're ahead of the ball game. Trust each other, value each other, and together we will accomplish our mission. And that's what I would have to share with our folks out there, Chief. So thank you again, and thank the boss for having me on this telecom. All right. Hey, thanks, Mr. Floyd. Appreciate you, my man. Thanks, as always, boss. Uh, enjoy being your wingman. And thank you, AFRC wingman out there in uh, virtual land. We appreciate you. It's a pleasure serving with you. We'll talk to you soon. Y'all take care.